Hi everyone, this is Jamie Peterson of Wolf from You. Thank you for joining us for the final webinar in our new Inversion 13.3 series. Today we have an outstanding panel of speakers online with us. Uh, we have Brett Champion speaking on updated visualization functionality. Charles Poe showing us the workflow uh, to publish digital content to AR and Ankit Naik, uh, who will be presenting on System Modeler and also the integration of System Modeler with Wolfram Language. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. So we're going to be talking today about what's new in visualization in Mathematica 13.3. So there's sort of two smaller features and then one larger feature that we're gonna talk about. And the first one I'm, I wanna mention almost as an aside is that several of the visualization functions got a style update, uh, in particular, the density and contour plots. So from version 10 through 13.2, we've been using this sort of ye light yellow to blue gradient uh, for the contour and density plots. Um, it's actually, I guess, blue at the bottom end to or light yellow at the top. And in 13.3, it's now using a color scheme that has a wider range of colors. It has more dynamic range. And you know, just to show off you know, an area where this you know, comes into effect is if you look at this region in the bottom right corner of the density plot, uh, previously you sort of maxed out the blue um, where in the new gradient scheme we have finer gradation and more room to have some variation um, going from the very bottom and then coming up to higher values. And this new color scheme is not exactly the same, but is you know, very similar to what we started using for our vector visualization functions in, math, in version 12.3. Uh, so again, this goes from you know, sort of a purplish up to a yellow. The exact shades are a little bit different because to account for how we perceive color when it's a discrete element on itself versus as part of a gradient and a larger element. The next thing I want to mention is haloing, which is a new directive for 2D graphics. And this is following in the recent trend of some of our um, shading primitives or shading directives. Um, halo, so we have haloing. Previously, we had blurring and drop shadowing and you know, some other things going further back. And so what haloing does is if you have your object here represented by a you know, black region, it's going to draw a color around the outside of that you know, for some distance, which is controllable. And then for some distance beyond that, you can have it fade off or blur out to the background, what's behind it. And so where might you want to use this? This is really useful for when you want something to show up against the background. And maybe you don't know what the background is, so you, you can't pick a specific color. And so here I have a busy set of, a busy graphic. There's, I don't know, 250 circles of different sizes and colors. And I've tried putting some text on top of it. And it, it's kind of hard to read what this text says because the black text is running into all the different colors. And here we do haloing with um, just some a white halo defaults is about a point or two around it. And now that text is very much easier to read because you have the black text, you have the white border, and it will stand out against pretty much anything. And one of my favorite examples of haloing is actually if you use a neg if you use negative distances. And so here we have 
a more complicated specification for haloing. We, we're giving two colors. We're giving a color for what the you know the hard color is, the hard region right next to the um, primitive, and we have a, a lighter version of that color that is what's going to fade off. Um, and so in this case, for every polygon on this map, we're doing haloing. But because we've said that the, our distances are negative, they're on the inside of the region. And so every polygon has its edge. And then coming inside, it's doing a haloing effect. And so then you get you know, these maps where the borders of the countries are sort of heavier. And then they fade off as you get into the interior. And this this effect was used a lot in sort of really old classic maps. And then people went to computers and they got sort of boring. Um, and now maps are starting to get you know, more stylized again. But um, it, it's a cool use of haloing. And like I said, this is probably my favorite example of haloing. And I. You know, it, it's in the documentation for haloing under applications, and so you may have seen it before um, in that context. So the main feature that I want to talk about for visualization in version 13.3 is new functionality for highlighting both interactive and static. And so we have a new option, plot highlighting, that control that does interactive highlighting for many visualization functions. Pretty much anything that generates points or curves has highlighting turned on by default. And what happens is when I do my plot and I move my mouse over the plot and I'm going to come in from the top and nothing happens, but when I get close to the curve, I get an interaction. And I apologize that with this style sheet, you know, how it does magnification for presentation mode, the highlighting effect doesn't get magnified. But what we have is we have a point that is now showing up on the curve, um, what I call the bouncing ball. And we have a call out that is showing me what the coordinates are. and as I move around, uh, the call out moves. And if I move into an area where I'm too far away from the curve, then I don't get any highlight. And then I get close again, and I start to see it. And as I said, this works for curves. It's working for um, you know point elements like list plots. They're slightly different in terms of when it becomes active. So for the list plots, you generally have to get a little bit closer to a point um, before it will uh, turn on. And the highlighting style is tied to the plot style in most cases. So here I have three curves. And when I get you know close to the blue curve, I've got a blue point and a blue bordered uh, call out. When I get close to the yellow curve, those are using the same colors, and the blue curve is um, doing it as well. And I wanted to sort of point out that the labels are pretty intelligent. Uh, so when I'm doing a date plot, I'm getting the date and the value corresponding to that point, uh, rather than, say, the x coordinate being in absolute time or something that's hard to inter <clears throat> Hard to interpret. And there are multiple sort of built in effects that are available to you. Uh, you can change the style when you move, when you mouse over something. You can get the ball. You can get drop lines that go to the axes. Or we have what I'm calling the slices, which, you know, for either the x direction or the y direction, are just drawing a line across the entire graphic and drawing points wherever anything uh, gets intersected. 
And so here's an instance of using style. So we have plot highlighting is trans is fully opaque red. Um, and for each of these random walks, the style is 50% transparent gray. Um, and, and that's so that we see things, um, you know, we don't, it doesn't look so much like things are getting obscured by elements in front. But so now, now as I move my mouse over the graphic, whichever curve I'm over highlights in red and I can see the entire history of it um, in a way that is easier than if I, you know, use say the default styling for this line, this, this line plot and we had 20 curves and each one of them is a different color and they just all run together and it's really hard to trace what the path of any particular curve is. And so here we have a parametric plot that is doing the drop line. And so when I move my mouse over the curve, I get the point and then I can see where uh, the line comes down to the axes uh, both in both the X and Y direction. And you know, if I'm on the other side, you know, in a different quadrant of the graphic, then you know, the, the lines are still going to the axes and I, you know, we still have our coordinate labels uh, showing up sort of wherever we go. And then I mentioned our X slice and Y slice. And so this is you know, sort of useful in this case where we have multiple curves and as I mouse over, then you get that line, you see all the intersection points, all the values at the same time. Um, an interesting thing about this is that because this is drawing a line across the entire graphic, the mouse tracking for it, you know, do I don't have to be close to a curve because you know, even if I'm close to you know, the green curve, I'm seeing everything for the yellow and blue. So even if I'm way over here on the top left corner, the effect is still active and it's still doing the highlighting. And so I can scrub across and see my values and see where things change. And if for some reason you want to disable highlighting, you know, in your particular application, it's becoming a distraction you can say plot highlighting goes to none, and then this is just going to be a um, plot, you know, as in previous versions, no highlighting. Um, and there are also some cases where we turn off the highlighting by default. So for example, you know, if we have a tooltip around a curve that you've specified, you probably want to see the tooltip and the system knows that, oh, there's a tooltip or there's other labels, or you turned the plot elements into buttons or hyperlinks or something, then I'm going to turn off the highlighting because, I mean, generally it ends up not being a good experience if multiple things are trying to react to mouses, uh, you know, to your mouse position at the same time. Um, and it gets confusing because you mouse over and you want to see one and you get the other. Um, and, and so in, in those situations, we turn it off by default. Um, but if you set it to a specific value, it will be active, but you know, sort of not necessarily predictable what's going to fire when. Um, it becomes sort of indeterministic sometimes. And as I mentioned, we have the everything we've seen. So all the examples I've shown so far have used the option. You can also do the same thing with the highlighted wrapper, which is especially useful if you want to highlight only a single element or only certain elements in a plot. So in this case, I'm highlighting the blue curve, but nothing happens for uh, the green or the yellow curves. We also have static highlighting, which is good for Right, I mean, so the interactive highlighting we think of as being geared toward exploration. So you have something and you want to interact with it and explore it and get a better understanding of it. 
and the static highlighting is good for explanation. So you have something and you want to explain it to a colleague or a student or somebody else. Um, and so in this case, we have the same highlighting effects, but they are no longer interactive. And so you do that by using placed of the effect and where you want the effect to be applied. And so in this case, this is X slice and it's going to interpret that seven as being the x coordinate for the x slice. And so here we have my mouse. Once I figure out where it went again. And so here at seven, we have our x slice. We have all the points. We have all the labels. I move around. Nothing happens. That's just a picture. I can put it in a paper or easily take a screenshot of it or export it or whatever I want to do to send it or share it with somebody. And you know, sort of as you see here, you don't need the full coordinates. Um, so if I do a drop line, it's going to pick x equals 8 in this case. Again, um, I can say automatic comma 8. And so this is going to basically be 8 is the y value. And the x value is whatever the x value happens to be. And, and so in this case, we actually end up with three places where the curve takes on the value 8. And we get drop lines for each of them. And, and in that case, we get the uh, coordinates for each of them. And um, one other thing I wanted to mention um, you know, with, say, the x slices is that you know, in, in this case, the coordinate is, you know, for x slice, the coordinate is just the y values because all of them have the same x value and you're probably not quite as interested in that. Um, and if you do specify full coordinates, so 8 comma 10 is um, 8 and 10 is you know, sort of off the curve a little bit. And if you notice, it got adjusted back down to 8 comma 7.9 to be on the curve. And it's possible to do custom highlighting by using uh, named components. So we have X line, which is the line that you saw in um, X slice, and Y label, which is just the label with the Y coordinate. And so here I just have it's close to x slice, but it doesn't have the ball on the curve as we move along. We can style it by putting things in a list and using associations with uh, styling parameters. So most of them support style. The label ones support basically all the call out options as parameters. So here I've made everything red and changed the call out appearance to something that just uh, that has a linear line and corners around the box. And so now I'll go ahead and answer a few questions. Uh, let's see. A request that color function be able to apply to different curves in a single plot. Um, there have been times where that would be useful. Um, it would be a little bit of a change and I, th I think potentially color function scaling gets a little bit more complicated in that case, um, but it, it's certainly something that you know, would be um, something we could do in the future. Is there a way to enlarge the callout text size? So it is possible to change that. Um, so if we go into the label, the style thing uh, for that, Label style goes to, let's try 24, see how badly this works, except I, apparently managed to delete part of the content. Da, 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 da. So X line, so that goes to red. Why do I have some sort of bracket mismatch?
Right. So, so if I change the label style in the parameters, then that will um, affect it. I think possibly even if I change label style at the graphic level. And that also affect it. So it is possible to change the uh, label, the, the callout uh, attributes, you know, sort of maybe not entirely globally, but you know certainly within a given application. And I, th I think that's about all the time I have for questions right now. And so I'm going to pass on to Charles Poe, who's going to talk about publishing and AR, and I'm going to stick around and answer more questions that may come up in chat. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Brett. Um, well, I'm Charles Poe, and I will try to give you an idea of the workflow we are putting in place for publishing or sharing your digital content to AR. So first to start, I mean, we all have, um, you know, in our pocket, you know, an iPhone or an Android phone. You know, they always come already kind of preset for AR. I mean, this day, you know, it's kind of the, the, the future of, of things and how people want to seamlessly integrate, you know, visual object to reality, right? You are working on the street, you want to find directions, right? It'd be nice that you just pull out your phone, look at it, and then it actually tell you the building or go left or right, right? So or if you're a professional or you have an iPad or iPad Pro or a tablet, you know, it already come with you know, all the capability to display object in AR, right? And more actually devices are coming in the future, right, to our home. Apple actually kind of push uh, lately a new device will come next year. So, you know, the Apple Vision Pro, for example, at home, you should be able to actually merge both in virtual and augmented reality like that. So what we try to do in version 13.3 is to try to kind of start to put in place all the, the, the basement, the, the foundation to actually allow you to take your graphics, your geometry, or anything which, you know, look nice and you generate in the Wolfram language and be able to directly publish it to your AR device. So how are you going to do that? So that's kind of one of the questions. So first, let's pull back a little bit. Most of those environments actually try to support a, a way to actually interchange that data from one device to another one. So let's assume you're in the desktop. You want to be able to take your teapot, like in this case, and push it to your AR device. So as usual, right, on the base of everything there in those layer of protocol, here it's, you know, it's a file format. One of the standard one is the USD which actually Apple is pushing and is originally be built by Pixar. It's a quite extensive file format and it actually allow you to both, you know, store the geometry, the shader, the lighting, the model and any additional information to it. So what we did in version 13, three is to actually add support of uh, USD and USD come into three formats, USDA, which is the ASCII form USDZ, which is the binary form, right? and USDC, which kind of encapsulate those, those general cases. So, so what I was saying is that essentially you can take you know, your teapot and say, okay, I want to export it to USD. So there you get the file. And in principle, if you take that file and push it to your, or share it on your, to your device, right, you should be actually able to see that uh, teapot. But that protest is not, that is your sample, and we'll discuss that a little bit later, how we try to stream up line that process. So US is one of the main file formats which come, and people hope that you'll be kind of the HTML for AR in the, in the near future. There was also, there is already another one which is more prominent on the Android world, which is uh, GLTF. That one is kind of a standard file format for 3D scenes. So it also includes line, um, the whole language for 3D scene. Com USD, compared to USD, USD is a little bit more extensive. It actually have more assets and more stuff there. So we also support uh, GLTF. So you can just, you know, 
take your object, in this case, the, the mesh region, and just say, hey, I want it in GLTF format, and you'll get it directly there. Right? And you know, just to show you the GLTF, which is more a test base, you can see actually the information uh, there of your GLTF uh, teapot. So all this is nice, but you know, how are you going to take your file, move it from your desktop here to your tablet or any other device you have? So in version 13, we introduce AR Publish. And essentially it's, it's a way for us to kind of make that workflow easy, right? And behind the scene, we, you know, we do the right transfer, we detect the right device where you are, and we try to actually generate directly that object uh, on your AI device, mobile phone or tablet. So let's just do a, you know, a simple demo. So I still have my same teapot there. If I just evaluate it, I will get a cloud object and a barcode. Obviously the cloud object mean we somehow took that uh, teapot and that information and we put it to our cloud. And I will stop sharing for a second and try to show you what I'm doing here. So if I stop sharing here. So if I take my, you know, I have a tablet in the office. I, if I take that tablet and um, essentially scan that barcode. And actually let me switch here and show you exactly what I see from my tablet. Okay. So for my tablet there, I, span the, I scan the barcode and automatically on, in this case, I'm using an iPad. It open uh, that barcode, which is actually a cloud object and directly detect that is actually a, you know, a USD file and it knows what to actually do. So in this case, if I just press, I say, okay, I want to see it. And there you have the teapot. And this is just on my desk in my office. And, you know, it's a teapot, which carry our geometry, our mesh. You can resize it, increase it, rotate it, or move it to any other area on your desk or anywhere else. Okay, so let me just move back here to our previous there. Okay, so this is essentially the workflow we plan to do or we, you know, we want to actually apply to all the digital content, right? We generate in the language, your graphic, your image and such. So we hope in the future that AR Publish will be just that function. You actually put your object and you take your device, you scan the barcode and then you get it on your device. So behind the scene, we take the file, we push it to the cloud, we detect your device appropriately and there you have the object. So it's actually a quite simple and natural workflow. We hope you, know, you all are going to play with and enjoy and share your digital content. And that's pretty much it. We have an extensive set of documentation. You can go to the AR Publish page, reference page USD, or even look at Steven's blog where he talk extensively about it. And I hope this will be kind of a fun tool for you to play with. And just keep in mind, this is kind of the general direction we are going in terms of publishing or sharing your digital contents. In earlier version, we introduced um, Printout 3D, which is also one way to take your geometry and actually build a 3D object using a 3D printer or an external service. So this is kind of just another set of features we, you know, we are adding toward you know, publishing and sharing digital content from the Wolfram language. So, that's pretty much what I want to talk today, and uh, I will see if there's a few questions. I see one unanswered question, Charles, about removing it from your device. Removing, and when they say removing, I believe you say removing the 3D object from the device. So the, by default, when you actually open it from the device, it's actually just a, like you can think about it, a web page. Right, so you directly open the web page on the device, and when you close that your browser, it will just go away. So it's not actually stored directly on your device. Okay. And there is another question from 
Roberto. So is the 3D object accessible forever or does it or does the link expire over time? Um, so this is a as I showed earlier, this okay, let's see if I come back. This is a cloud object, right? So that means it has all the mechanism for privacy. So you can publish it by default. We call it publish, so it's open to everybody. But you can change the option, we set the option of the cloud object to be private and be just restricted to you or to the people you actually want to share. As long as your cloud, your browser have the, you know, can connect to the cloud and to the appropriate, uh, with appropriate uh, access and such. So there's another question from Robert here. Is there a source of 3D object where we can find objects other than the teapot? Um, yes. Um, so I would suggest to go to the resource uh, repository. So when I say when you stay in the Wolfram language, we first have example data, which have a collection of objects. So if I do geometry 3D, uh, I believe I should do that. So first, this is a little set of ob you know, objects. You see that the teapot is there, but you can also go to our resource repository. And if I open the data repository here, so you see that there is a collection of object, geometric objects. So I can see Utah teapot. Or other object there you can find in the, our repository. And we we hope in future version to introduce, um, you know, geometry search, for example, where you can, you know, say, hey, I want the following type of object and we'll automatically find or build you that type of geometry. So you can access to our repository. There is there, there is example data. And in the future, we'll have more functionality to actually generate model for you. Okay, I think that's all the question I get today. So if there's more, you know, feel free to put it there and we try to answer them. And uh, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Ankit from Wolfram System Modeler team. Uh, so I will show the product as we go on, but just to give a brief introduction, what System Modeler is. So System Modeler is a modeling and simulation tool that is used to uh, model digital twins of uh, systems like power plants, uh, automotive, automobile, or, or an aircraft. And it can also be used to model social systems like spread of an infectious disease or modeling a sales funnel that is used in marketing to see the customer transitions. So anything that changes with time, you can use the graphical environment of system modeler to model it. And we will look more into it as we go on. So in this presentation, uh, I will uh, cover the key features of 13.3 that enables a user to uh, quickly create, uh, validate, and share their models or digital twins. Uh, version 13.3 had a lot of uh, a lot of improvements, a lot of features, but in this presentation, I want to focus on three key features. The first one is how do you gamify your simulation results? Second, once you have a model and you have some experimental data, how do you calibrate your model using the experimental data automatically? And the third thing, once you have the model, how can you share your models and libraries with others, including assets like licenses, CAD objects, uh, images, etc. So first, uh, like, how do you gamify your simulations? And to do this, first let me open up uh, System Modeler. I'll open it here. So for people who are new to System Modeler, this is the modeling interface of System Modeler where we ha you have this Modelica library, which has different sub libraries on different domains, like electrical, mechanical, and so on. And you can just drag and drop components from this library, which has around thousand different uh, pre-made components that you can directly drag and drop, and you can create your own models. In this example, I have a model of a wind turbine, 
And if I double click on this wind turbine, it shows the different blocks that are used uh, to, gen to, to model a wind turbine. And you can see here, we have a block to calculate wind power. Uh, and then we have some uh, arithmetic blocks, like it's the product of the wind speed and other things. And uh, this and this blocks, if I go in depth, uh, they have uh, the the normal equations, uh, like like power is half rho area times wind cube and all those things. And it ha also has some uh, empirical uh, empirical data empirical relations on how. Uh, the power is related to the wind speed and, and so such things. So you can create such blocks and then you can just drag and drop and combine them to create your model. But what I want to discuss in this section is uh, what's new in 13.3. So the thing is, once you create a model of a wind turbine, uh, you have set all the properties. The next thing that you would want to do is how would your wind turbine uh, behave as you change in the wind speed? Uh, like how can you uh, like it's one way of doing it would be just to add a constant block or a ramp block to it and the other way it would be to just be able to play 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 with it and in 13.3 what you can do is you can attach uh, input to your model and then if I go to experiment setup over here uh, besides the play button I can set uh, like I can run this simulation as a real-time simulation. So here I have set synchronize with real-time goes to true and I click OK. And then when I simulate this button here using this uh, play button here, I get to a view called simulation center. And in this view, you, uh, you access uh, the different uh, results from your model. I will pause it for, for, for now. Here you have access to, let's like, say, the wind turbine uh, component, and you can plot any uh, all any variable from the subcomponents used inside the wind turbine. So you have access to all the variables, and using this simulation center view, you can uh, you can test how the model behaves. But what you can do in thirteen point three is you can add a control object like a slider. So here I select wind speed. I select a slider input and I can give a wind speed like let's say from zero kilometer per hour to let's say 100 kilometer per hour. So I create a slider, attach it to my wind speed input, click OK, and then I run my simulation. Now as there is, uh, as there is no wind, that we have no power generated, but as I, as I move in, uh, as I increase my wind speed, you could see that the wind speed increases, but my power coefficient is zero and there is no wind power. And as soon as the wind speed uh, crosses a certain wind speed value, which is called cut in speed, there is, certain, there is certainly a, uh, the, the wind speed started producing power. And as I change my, as I increase my wind speed, I can see how much power is being generated. And if my power goes beyond a certain value, like the cutoff speed of the wind turbine, then you can see that in my model, I have a cutoff, uh, a cutoff limit, and then no power is generated, even if the wind is very high, because the blade speed uh, goes beyond the design limit. And here, now just using the slider, varying the wind speed dynamically, I can play around and test if my simulation, uh, like how my simulation works. Right, so, so far I've covered like how in version 13.3, you can add sliders to your input, uh, play it in real, in real time and see how the model behaves. The other thing that you can do is, uh, uh, let's say once you have the simulation, you want to do some simple arithmetic or simple uh, post simulation analysis on this. So for instance, uh, you have this generated power, you want to divide that with the nominal power or the rated power of the machine, and you want to uh, get a capacity factor, like what is the capacity factor that the wind turbine is, is currently running at. To do that, I will create a subplot. And here in 13.3, you can add a plot expression. So here I go to plot and click add plot expression. And once I go here, I would say, I would list the variable 
in this case it's wind turbine power output divided by uh, let's say 4 4.3 megawatt or something like that 4.3 times 1 1 2 3 4 5 6 and then i would give it a label capacity factor so the units here are in si units so i put a label and here you can see uh, i can do quick post processing by creating expressions and once i do that if i want to save this analysis in my model i can just click on the plot name and i would do update plot in model and the next time when i uh, when i simulate this model this new expression that I created is automatically stored in the model and I would view it again. So you don't need to redo the entire step again. Right. So getting back to my presentation. So, so far you saw how you can interact with real time simulations by using sliders and try to gamify your simulation and test different scenarios. You saw how you can do post-processing analysis by creating expressions or model variables and how you can store it so that you can access it at a later time. The next thing uh, is because uh, system, so system modeler is tightly integrated with the Wilfram language. And in this example, like once you have a digital twin, uh, it's a theoretical model. But once you have the, the actual model, uh, actual power plant, you get the experimental values and then the next thing that you would want to do is calibrate your model parameters to match those experimental values and with 13.3 we have a new function that enables you to, that helps you in automatically calibrating your model parameters so here i have a model of a hybrid motor and as you can see the the model of this the model consists of uh, if I zoom in, the model consists of an of a electrical circuit and then we have an EMF component which combines the electrical circuit to the mechanical circuit. And for, for your motor, you might have, you don't know what the damping or the stiffness values of the shaft that is used in the, in the motor is, or you don't know what's the resistance or the inductance values of your, of your motor. So, so what you do is you then use, uh, you do some experiments and this is like how the velocity for given input, how the angular velocity is changing. You plot the, the, the experimental values. And then uh, we have this new system model uh, calibrate function. Uh, and what this does is it takes in the, in the experimental data and then you specify what are the different parameters that you want this uh, this function to tune and here you can see you can it's showing it's taking two different it's checking different values for the resistance and damping and here it's trying to prov uh, to give like what is the loss uh, like based on the loss function that is used here like how it's getting there like how it's uh, trying to match to the experimental results and uh, and how far it has reached so far. Uh, and then you can just, uh, it's like when, when it doesn't find any solution, it just stops, or you can just press this, uh, this stop button if you are happy with the result. Uh, and then once you do that, if, you, if I click stop, it results a calibrated model. And once you have the calibrated model, then you can use, then you can just compare how your digital twin of your DC motor uh, like be, uh, like uh, matches the experimental data and here you can see the blue curve is from the calibrated model and the orange uh, points are from the experimental data and I was able to quickly uh, tune my model parameters so if you try to do this manually it would take you like half an hour to like to one hour but now you can just do it within one minute Right, and, and, and this is possible because of the tight uh, integration with, uh, with the Wolfram language. Finally, uh, let's say you have your model, you are very happy with it, uh, and it works as you expect, and you have everything calibrated. 
The next thing that you want to do is you want to share it, let's say with your students or with your colleagues or you with your friends. And it has, let's say some CAD objects that are attached to it or you want some licensing conditions. So people just don't take away your work uh, without following any license. So now with 13.3, you can export this, uh, this, this model as a SMA archive, or basically you can create installers from your model. So to do that, you go to export and create library archive. And once you do that, you can give uh, the installer a name. For instance, I have like, I would say wind turbine. And since uh, you have developed this using a new version of system modeler, you can specify like, what is the compatibility of this model? So people using old version of system modeler, they are aware that if something breaks, it's because it's not compatible with the new version. And then you go to compatibility, let's say 13.2, and then you are done. Like you can then just click okay and the installer is automatically created. Or you can just go to library details and let's say add a copyright notice. Let's say I would add built from research and then you can add a license agreement file to it. So I have a license file, an HTML file, I would just add to it and then click OK. And then I would just save it over here. And here my SMA is, uh, my installer is created. So now let me just delete, unload my file. I would create, click this link. Uh, it opened in my other window. So here you can see windturbine.sma is the installer. I drag it in and here it has a nice interface now, which takes the icon here and it shares wind turbine version one and will from research as I'd mentioned there. When I click install, install library, the library license agreement uh, is, is displayed. Then I click okay. And then if I click okay, it's now installed under my library section here. So anyone who uses this, they will have this wind power installed in the libraries thing, and then they can uh, start and play around, uh, play around with the model. So this entire workflow has been introduced in 13.3 that helps you in easily sharing, um, sharing your models uh, without uh, any, without uh, like creating, like improving the, uh, improving the experience of the users who are trying to use your models. So it's much better now. Right. So these were the three features that I wanted to cover. Uh, right. Okay. But there are some things that I wanted to also men quickly mention is uh, previously. Um, so now with 13.3 uh, in using the Wolfram cloud, you can, uh, you can add time series to your system models. You can add interpolation curves and you can also add noise generators. So this three where we were not uh, supporting it in the previous, uh, in the previous versions, but now in the cloud, everything, all the models of system modeler works. So system modeler is now completely, system modeling functionalities are now completely compatible in the cloud. Uh, and then uh, there, are, there have been other improvements, like when you work with, uh, with larger models, it takes a lot of time to build because the compiler uh, goes through the equation and finds, the, finds uh, the optimum way of solving it. But now you can keep working on something else while this happens. So, so now you can build and simulate concurrently. Also, there's a good news for Mac OS uh, ARM platform users uh, in 13.3, uh, the simulations, the build and simulation time is 40% less uh, than that of 13.2. So the, so, the, so the experience has improved there. Uh, if you want to, uh, to know more uh, or to, more, to know more about the different things that I covered in today's talk, uh, you can go to the what is new in system modeler page where we have all the different things that I covered with some examples uh, that you can uh, that you can just uh, you have all the models available freely. You can just have a look and then uh, try it for yourself. Right. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you. Uh,
uh, and then just to summarize, you saw in this presentation how you can conveniently share your models using uh, like creating by creating installers, how you can gamify uh, your simulations and test how the model behaves. And finally, how you can use the combination of Wolfram language and system modeler to automatically calibrate your model parameters. Right. Yes, uh, Sergio, uh, is, are there any questions? Uh, yes, there were a couple of questions. So one was about whether you could share the this wine power model uh, with the attendance. Uh, sure. I will pass it on to Jamie later on and, and she can send it over. Uh, right. Uh, then there is, uh, okay, that we just had a comment, uh, uh, a question about whether there is a web version of system modeler. Right. So there is no web version of system modeler, but once you have the model, uh, here is... Uh, Okay, so the thing is, uh, I don't need to share the wind turbine model. It's already there. So if you go to the what is new page and you you go to this expanded system models in the cloud and there is a link to a cloud notebook, uh, which should be up pretty soon. Uh, and this cloud notebook actually has uh, the model as a cloud object. I'm just waiting for it to to load. But yeah, uh, but uh, and the thing is, we don't have a, a web version of system modeler. But once you have the model, you can just import the model as a MO file. And then once you import the model, then you can uh, then you can plot the model. You can do parametric simulation from it. Uh, and there are different ways that you can use then that you can use it in the cloud. So if I go to resources. And if you go to like analyzing systems using system modeler and Wolfram language, this course, the entire thing that is done in this course, you can do it uh, using the Wolfram cloud. So we have analysis support, I could say, or you can programmatically create models in the Wolfram cloud, but we don't have the, a GUI, a web-based GUI for system modeler yet. And here is the notebook that I was mentioning before. So here is the wind turbine uh, notebook. And here you can see, you can do a cloud import of this. And once you do a cloud import, uh, then you can, you will have this model loaded as a cloud object and you can just download it and use it in system modeler. And here you can see, once you have the model, the next thing that I've done here is for a given location, I have extracted the wind speed data for a for between two different days. And then I have updated, there is something called a timetable here. So which gives, uh, so where you can add real world data as a time value, uh, so y, y versus time uh, data set. And then you can uh, use something called a system model manipulate resource function, which automatically creates a nice looking manipulate for you where you can play around with the different parameters. Right. Ankit, would you like us to push out that poll at this time? Sure, sure. Right, Sergio, are there any questions or are is, is there anything that you would like to add that I might uh, have missed? Okay, that suddenly we had uh, like three more questions. <laughs> uh, one is, um, someone is asking if you necessarily need system model to create the model. Uh, um, I think you might answer it better, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I think that so in, in theory, it, it is possible to create models from from the world language. Uh, but the biggest advantage of you working with system model is that you have the graphical interface, and uh, it it's, it definitely improves your workflow when you can track uh, everything that you are doing. Uh, but you can you can create and import models from from Mathematica. Uh, so theoretically speaking, Sergio, that is uh, like you don't don't even need system modeler once you uh, like you can actually create a model programmatically in the Wolfram language and then simulate and analyze in the Wolfram language without even using system modeler, right? 
exactly yes. for some for some simple ex, for some simple examples of course as you scale right. up as you create more hierarchical model it's easier when you have a gui because that helps you to to easily visualize how the different components are built how they are connected but mm -hmm. uh, if you just have a very simple example perhaps then that's then everything can be done with the wolfram language because wolfram language comes with the system model kernel as well right right and and then there are some features that you only have in system model like the the thing that you have already about uh, showing the control panel in uh, in real time simulation that's something that um that uh, at the moment it's only it only exists in synthesis system model right um so when it's asking if we can use system model in some what some work of engineering um Yes, the system model. Uh, if I, the thing is, if you want to. So, for any questions, like the the best go to place for me is good is the what's is the what's new page or the system model landing page, and here we have examples. Uh, so here we have examples from different engineering domains, uh, and also life sciences uh, and other domains. We also have examples from computational biology. So let's say you are interested in industrial manufacturing. You would click this, and there there are some pre-made uh, examples, free examples that you can quickly uh, let's see and download the models and so on. And there are other examples uh, listed here. So for instance, you can use it to to model what is the thermal stresses uh, in a container if you if you if you have different types of fluids inside it and so on. And then you can also download this flu full model uh, free of charge. And test. So, whatever you're trying to do, you, a best place to see uh, how it's done, or to, the best place to get a template to get started is the the examples page in System Modeler. And it's used for engineering, and also for you can also model uh, like system dynamics. For instance, uh, let's say understanding. So, here is like. Uh, uh, more of a causal loop diagrams. Uh, this is used in system dynamics uh, uh, like community where you have this causal loops and then like those kind of system which are not engineering based, those kind of things can also be modeled with system model. Right. Uh, yes, and someone is asking about uh, epidemiological models. Uh, Yes, so I think let me try to bring it up. Uh, there was, so we already have uh, um, an example, COVID-19 study impact of policies, where, which you can, ha which ha you can have a look where uh, we have modeled like the only the SIR model so we start with the susceptible population and then there is a rate at which this entire group is group converts to infected or if they are vaccinated they go to the recovery part and from in infected they go to the recovery part and in this example if there is some policy impact factor what it does it it impacts the r naught number and that controls the rate at which susceptible moves to the infected category so these examples are, al are also there uh, and then in this example you can have a nice mathematical uh, a nice uh, uh, what do you call it a manipulate where you can have this manipulators and you can test and you can test how r naught number changes and based on that you can test different scenarios so this already exists and it's free of and you can you can try it out <laughs> 